Back to the end then of our Skeleton Key to Foucault's Madness and Civilization. Let's take a moment to just sort of review what we've done. So uh, we began with, the, with leprosy in the Middle Ages as the marginalized identity with a moral panic and worries about contamination that ultimately led to the construction of lazar houses, places of confinement and ritual exclusion. Um, in which those on the outside defined themselves and mirrored, uh, recognized each other as not being the leper inside. And that um, um, Foucault argues that in the medieval era in general, uh, the mad or those suffering from mental illness wouldn't have been ritually excluded or viewed as contaminating in some way. In fact, uh, they would be intermixed in the Gothic and medieval age with the general population. There'd be no difference between um, someone who was mad and someone who wasn't, or someone who was unreasonable and someone who wasn't. You're living in medieval society in which you're engaged in a serious, uh, strenuous first life of work and obligation and even a uh, serious devout uh, uh, you know, religious ritual. And then you have a kind of folly, foolish, madcap, carnivalesque second life, to use the language of Bakhtin and following the logic of, of Durkheim. You have these two split off dissociated dialogic, two logics uh, of life that, um, in, so that if you're a member of such a society, medieval society, you must go mad sometimes. Uh, you must experience these, these times of folly, right? That everyone in the society is expected to participate in the carnivalesque moments and then to follow that with Lenten retreat back into first life. So carnival in Lent, uh, first and second life. All right, well, that sort of intermixture of madness and uh, non-madness ends or at least begins to end during the Renaissance with the ship of fools and the uh, fools pilgrimage and other sort of efforts that were made to force the mad, right, uh, or the mentally ill out of everyday society. So the homogenous texture of early modern cities or early modern spaces, at, at least during the Renaissance, the, the idea was we're going to create the homogeneity through the expulsion of those who aren't uh, homogenous like us, right? So the mad are placed on ships of fools or encouraged to go on, on fools pilgrimages and, uh, and are forced out. So this would, so it's something like, I don't know, mental um, um, cleansing, you know, uh, uh, the cleansing of the mentally ill out of society, something like that, something that quite honestly Hitler and the Nazis actually did in addition to the um, concentration camps that led to the extermination of uh, you know of the other categories from Jewish to um, you know to socialists um, mentally ill and uh, disabled people were killed as well so so at any rate it's, it's, so you create so this is the logic of the Renaissance is creating homogenized space through ritual exclusion, and then that's followed by what he calls the great confinement, the creation of this of uh, of this um, space of intensified torture, uh, torturous work, torturous living conditions, that terrorize the population who were threatened with confinement, and then forced people into acceptance of degraded wage labor and degraded living conditions um, and really gave power, quite honestly, to the emergent bourgeoisie over the proletariat. This would be Marx's argument uh, uh, during this period of great confinement. And so, uh, so the poor, the unemployed, the dispossessed, the displaced from the rural regions uh, um, uh, d during the period of primitive accumulation found themselves drawn, forced to cities, right, herded to cities, and then, um, and then saw the impending vacuuming into the houses of confinement that would force uh, um, um, an acceptance of anything, any job, any employment for self, for children, for family that would keep you out.
So Marx writes about this and Foucault backs it up. So what you wind up with then are these spaces of confinement that are undifferentiated and that are primarily located uh, uh, to uh, build a wage labor uh, uh, proletariat. So it's the poor and the unemployed primarily that are in and the mad get included. And the chapters that follow then, chapter three on the insane, chapter four on passion and delirium, chapter five on aspects of madness, and then even on doctors and patients, he, Foucault then tells us about alterations of concepts of and, and, and sim, sort of symbolic categories and imaginary constructs of mental illness, madness, you know, lunacy, insanity, these kinds of things, right? That, that occur both in and outside of these spaces of confinement. So his argument is going to be that there's going to be new asylums built or new ways of confining people. You're really going to have a 200, maybe a 250-year period where the mad intermix with the unemployed, the debauched, the drunk, you know, these other categories that he talks about. And then he writes about it in his other books. So we ended last um, uh, uh, recording with... Um, with that and let's see we were at a point of I think we were in chapter four on passion and uh, delirium and um, I don't know what I really want to tell you about that I think I'd like to move quickly through it again I'll just say as a sociologist uh, a critical sociologist of of um, of the political economy of capitalism, you know, these chapters are a little less interesting to me. They're more uh, uh, effective and I think more engaging for those who are specialists in, in the study of social control or of uh, history of medicine, history of mental illness, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe, maybe we should just jump right away to this. Um, there were some really good examples, but I'm not certain that they're in this section. Um, but it ends basically with the argument that confinement did not cure but simply excluded, eliminated, and contained mad people or unreasonable people. That uh, reason was created and produced by the exclusion of its negation, right? So that, again, goes back to this early image here, is that whatever is outside the identification, the recognition that goes on, we are, we, whatever we are out here, we're reasonable, right? Because the unreasonable are inside. That's not who we are. So you get, you get civilization created through the exclusion of some marginalized and stigmatized category. Okay, so chapter five then is more interesting, aspects of madness. Um, so yeah, this is bizarre. It's a bizarre chapter about the error-ridden, uh, really body and physical um, explanations that emergent uh, sort of medicine and, you know, psychiatric, um, it isn't quite psychiatry of it, right? That, they, that these emergent caregivers sort of had for, for, uh, for madness. Um, and it covers, you know, manic depression. Uh, you know, I, and I said, I thought the most interesting section of that might be page 157. So we're moving through the book really rapidly here, skipping massive chunks of it, which I would have my students do uh, in class. Um, yeah, so this is the section, um, yeah, where there's a sort of a mention that uh, of, of a move that took place where where the individual is viewed as sort of a victim of society, that if you're suffering from mental illness or madness, it probably is society itself that generated it, right? So one suffered from an excessive solidarity with all beings around one. One was no longer compelled by one's secret nature. Um, uh, one was the victim of everything which on the surface of the world solicited the body and the soul. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know how, how enlightening that was or not. Let's move on to doctors and patients, the next section. Okay, so in the next chapter then, um, yeah, you get uh, early therapeutics in two locations. So, so here's the basic argument. You got all these people who are uh, uh, assembled in um, these houses of confinement, um, and now you have people who are going to treat and develop therapeutic procedures for those who are suffering from mental illness and, and, and other maladies too, right? So early therapeutics outside of the hospital and the confinement are described. Uh, these there are four kinds, page 159, consolidation and strengthening of dispossessed spirits. Let's leave that one aside. I don't find that very interesting. It just seems wrongheaded. Page 162, 
is this section on the on purification again that the, the idea that the body itself or something's going on organically with the body so bleeding blistering purging you know purging uh, uh, the body of impurities right so in the same way that society is purified by purging uh, it of of um, of the mad the mad are purified by purging them of impurities within right uh, colonic irrigation stomach purges you know forced uh, throwing up that kind of thing um, page 166 a third type of of therapeutics that again that this is outside of the institution as well as inside but mostly outside immersion bathing showers hot and cold water treatments and so on um, these did wind up inside eventually and by the 19th century you know there were there were asylums that had these immense powerful uh you know uh water-based therapeutics right so um this isn't simply taking a bath like the uh, the man below, but really getting doused from above and below and, um, you know, the person in the corner and then just getting hit from all sides with these powerful jets of, again, ice cold water, that kind of thing, right? So, um, yeah, immersion, bathing, showering, that kind of thing. And then finally, regulation movement using exercise, even using travel, even music and so on. And then within the hospital, uh, uh, other forms of treatment were being developed. And these are interesting. Uh, uh, page 184 is the description of awakening. And so I like this section. I like to have students read it because the um, examples are so interesting, right? Um, they're not nice, but they're interesting. So page 185, yeah. Um, uh, where was it? it? There's all these... So the shocking section, yeah, okay, where's the shocking section? The shock section, yeah, so to awake someone, so the idea, a delirium is a waking dream, and to wake someone from a, a waking dream, you have to shock them, right? Wake them up, shake them up a little bit. So the invasion of, uh, of wakefulness, trying to get people woke in the language of the contemporary political right who's concerned with people being woke. Um, anyway, it's asserted that a gun discharged near her, her yeah, cured a young girl of convulsions contracted as a result of severe grief. So it's that kind of thing, right? Just a shock to the system of some kind, which is really what that water was doing in that previous image, right? So uh, there were convulsives at Harlem and uh, the city hospital had an epidemic of convulsions, you know, people going in convulsive fits. And, um, and so what they did, they brought in a stove filled with burning coals and iron hooks of a certain form that was heated in the coals. And the um, administrator of the city hospital spoke in a loud voice and said, look, we've tried everything else to get you to stop convulsing to the patients. And so what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna use another rem remedy. We're gonna burn to the bone with red hot irons a certain spot of the arm of any person, male or female, who suffered an attack of a convulsive illness. And then apparently that sort of shocked them out of it, that kind of thing. All right, the next uh, form of treatment was theatrical representation. So the idea was, is that you would present before the eye of the patient uh, something that would force them to, uh, uh, to a realization, right? Um, so yeah, where you get an image placed before you that would, again, that would, that would counteract the delirium that you're under. Um, Okay, and so the examples here are really interesting. So, um, so the cure of a melancholic who believed himself damned while still on earth because of the enormity of the sins he had committed, and the impossibility of convincing him by reasonable arguments that he could be saved, his physicians accepted his um, delirium and caused an angel, and they dressed someone as an angel, to appear to him dressed in white with a sword in its hand, and after a severe exhortation, this delusive vision announced that his sins had been uh, remitted, then forgiven, and then he went on, and apparently that helped the sufferer uh, uh, get better. Uh, there was a sufferer who thought that he was dead, who actually thought he was dead and was really dying, uh, but he wasn't dead, he was dying from not eating. And a group of persons um, who had made themselves pale and were dressed like the dead, yeah, yeah, um, entered his room, set up a table, brought food, and began to eat and drink before the bed. The starving dead man looked at them, 
and was astonished that, and they were astonished that he stayed in bed, and they persuaded him that dead people eat at least as much as living ones, and then he readily accommodated himself to the idea. So the ruse prevented him from dying. They told him that they sort of convinced him it was true. What was going on was true. Both of these cases are. We're going to complete the fantasy, right? You have a partial fantasy. We're going to complete the fantasy, and that'll dissolve the symptoms when it happens, right? All right. So you think you're dead, so you won't eat. We're going to complete the fantasy and tell you that actually dead people eat. Okay. Um, when an invalid believes that he has a living animal shut within his body, apparently this is a delusion, one must pretend to have withdrawn it. If it is in the stomach, one may, by means of a powerful purge, right, make him throw a, uh, produce this effect, throwing such an animal into the basin without the patient's noticing. I've got, a, I've got a cat within me, doctor, and then throw it into the basement, right? So this theatrical advice helps them, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, you complete the fantasy. There was a uh, physician who dissipated the dream of a melancholic who imagined he had no head, but only kind of void in its place. The physician entered the delirium, agreed that the sufferer's uh, request that there was no, uh, agreed at the sufferer's request to fill up the space, and he placed upon his head a great ball of lead. The discomfort of the head, where the sufferer didn't think he had one, was so painful that the invalid gave up the, uh, the delusion. Um, there's, uh, there's all kinds of things like that, right? Um, Okay, and then, then the third form of treatment was the return to the immediate. So this is sort of a discussion of, of getting people out of their head and getting them in their body instead and getting them immersed in, in sort of their surroundings and nature in, um, and so on, right? Like the, the, the nature cure. I just love this. this is from Rousseau. Um, Until that time, I had exercised my soul and rested my body, and I changed my ways. I exercised my body and rested my soul. I gave up books and turned my eyes to the works of nature, which addressed all my senses in a language that neither time nor nations can corrupt. So you immerse in the immediacy of a rich um, uh, natural or, or stimulating environment. And then, again, that creates mindfulness and and uh, um, and. Uh, and dispels symptoms, that kind of thing. And so, you know, the creation of gardens was part of this stuff. So, um, yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, page uh, 196 is a description of Pennell's garden, right? Um, yeah, where the, I just love this stuff. And so there it was. The inmates were leaving gaily for the various parts of a vast enclosure. Here's enclosure in a different way. Um, that belongs to the hospital, sharing a sort of emulation, the tasks appropriate to the seasons, cultivating wheat, vegetables, concerned in turn with the harvest, the trellises, with the vintage, with oil uh, picking, and finding in the evening in their solitary asylum, calm and quiet sleep. So being thrust into the immediacy of, uh, of again, of kind of diverting activities and, and a rich, stimulating environment uh, dissolved um, uh, the mental illness, right? So those are some of the treatments that were going ongoing um, amongst, again, you can see some of the enlightened uh, ideas that were there. All right, but then he shifts to, uh, to the great fear. So this is chapter 199. So for a variety of reasons, there's an emergence of, um, of threats to reason outside, probably due to, you know, uh, revolutions and the passions associated with it, even religious passions and things were, were it too. So fear of crowds and that kind of thing. So, uh, so these, these sort of threatened or insecure uh, uh, reason and civilization led to a great fear of contamination of irrationality from the mad. And, um, and so, then, so then the stigma then of unclassified confinement. So this worry was that um, the mad were going to be um, contaminating. So if, if you took like a young girl who was uh, pregnant and without means, and put her in one of these um, institutions, she would be um, exposed to, um, yeah, the wagons of criminals, men in chains who pass, pass through the city. Yeah, yeah, a fear arose, a fear formulated in medical terms, but animated basically by a moral myth. So it's a moral panic. Evil itself is coming from these people inside of this institution. Um, yeah, so like medieval horror, the Gothic reappears in the form of the madman, that kind of thing, and the mad who are inside. Um, 
Yeah, in the very places where the lepers had once been kept, it was as if across the centuries the new tenants had received the contamination, the contagion, right? So you get the return of the repressed moral panic of the leper in the 19th, uh, 18th century, right? So, um, yeah. So the stigma that's associated with mental illness really explodes at this time. And again, it, it, it's probably because of the instability and the fragility of the social order and uh, concerns of unreason and unrest and, and uh, revolution and those kinds of things. Um, so the themes of an evil, both physical and moral, then enveloped in this very ambiguity, mingle powers of corru corruption and horror, corrosion horror, rottenness. Um, yeah, and the evil began to ferment in these closed spaces of confinement, and then it would spread out. So this idea that the wards are a dreadful place where all crimes together ferment and spread around them as by fermentation, a contagious atmosphere, which those who live there breathe and which seems to become attached to them. These burning vapors of, of madness, right, are uh, rising, spreading through the air and finally fall upon the neighborhood, impregnating bodies and contaminating souls. Contagion of evil is rottenness. So yeah, so this moral panic attached to the idea of a contagious other, right? People are laden with maleficent vapors. Entire cities are threatened by simply the presence of, 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 uh, of these people. And of course, if you're actually thrown in a cell, uh, all those forms of unreason which had replaced leprosy in the geography of evil and which had been banished into remotest social distance now became a visible leprosy and offered their running sores to the promiscuity of men. Unreason was once more present, but marked now by an imaginary stigma of disease which added power of terror. So, um, yeah, so there was this new, again, in the, in the emerging, uh, again, capitalist order and modern order and the politics of modern cities and so on, he had the, this moral panic surrounding um, uh, the mentally ill. Okay. And so then this huge outcry of the need to separate. You know, here's the thing about the young girls mixing, right? Uh, 47 girls, most of them very young, more thoughtless than guilty, and always this confusion of ages, this shocking mixture of frivolous girls with hardened women who can teach them only the art of the most unbridled corruption. So because we're not classifying inmates and enclosing them in an undifferentiated order, you're getting mingled madmen, libertines, the, um, invalids, criminals, enormous reservoir, the fantastic, a dormant world of monsters supposedly engulfed in the darkness of Bosch, right? That kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, so there it goes on. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's the great fear, the stigma of all of this. So sadism, you know, Desaad is, is in prison, but, you know, a lot of his writings deal with basically confined and imprisoned subjects being exposed to all kinds of perversity and cruelty uh, during confinement. So there's a new division in chapter seven that or you know, eight that emerges. Really, it's a double movement where uh, there's an emerging humane sympathy really coming out of the Pietist and Quaker movement for uh, the maltreated insane. They're not criminals, or they're being treated and punished worse than criminals actually are. But the real movement of this new division is the fear of contagion. So what you wanna do is take the mad or the mentally ill and put them in separated, classified uh, institutions where only those who are mentally ill wind up and then have separate houses for the poor and otherwise. And so that is what this image was supposed to depict, right? So if you begin with the ship of fools and exclusion and expulsion, you wind up with a great confinement where everybody in an undifferentiated way who doesn't fit the moral order winds up. Well, now there's this fear that they're contaminating everyone with their contagion of irrationality and immorality. And in the modern world, the age of the asylum, you have specialized differentiated institutions where you basically develop treatment protocols for the people inside. So in the 19th century, the terror is supposed to decline and the treatment is supposed to increase. The therapeutics become dominant and the punitive and disciplinary side goes down. Now we know in Foucault's other works from the history of sexuality and discipline and punishment that that never actually quite really happens. There was an intention uh, on, on good sort of heart, good hearted reformers, but often the punitive and simply the disciplinary element takes over. But here, Right? The big idea is simply to prevent the contagion. So we're going to separate out the mentally ill from other confined populations. Let as many of the confined go using outdoor relief. So this is interesting. Um, 
Michael Katz's book, In the Shadow of the Poor House, A Social History of Welfare in America, really deals a lot with the use of outdoor relief during this period. So, uh, so there are two ways of treating poverty in Europe and America. You could bring people indoors into a poor house, confine them, or you could provide them with cash and keep them outside. Usually the cash was cheaper, actually. And then during this period, like, like people who are simply unemployed and poor were kept outside. So unemployment insurance today is provided too. You don't go to a workhouse to get it. Okay, so, so page 220, this is the beginning of classification. Poverty is seen as a partially social and economic problem, not a moral problem. So you can just simply get supported outside with outdoor relief. Awareness that confining the poor took them out of wage labor force. So if you want to continue to build the labor force, keeping the poor inside is bad. So again, you want them outside on unemployment, which runs out and they go back to work. Page 235, hospitals and, and confinement are reduced to the mad. Everyone else is moved anywhere else. So confinement um, leaves, uh, yeah, yeah. So, con yeah. so confinement no longer terrorizes as its primary function, but rather avoiding contamination. So we're not trying to, to, to uh, terrorize the working population. We're trying to confine uh, uh, the possibility of, of, um, of, of, uh, of contamination. So then now we wind up with the birth of the asylum. So that's the birth of like the Morristown, New Jersey State Asylum, these massive facilities for treating uh, the mentally ill. All states in the United States had, and I think everyone did. Um, um, that's one of the uh, um, hospitals that uh, for the mentally ill that, uh, that Foucault writes about in in France, here's an. I found this image of of the um, of the state hospital for insane asylum at St. Peter, Minnesota, actually burning. Um, and I, I I I won't show some of the more graphic, horrible images of it. But again, the you're still confined though, right? So so you're confined and burning to death because because you're confined, right? Bars on the windows that prevented um, the inmates from getting out. So yeah. Anyway, um, so, so these institutions are being built. And, um, and one of the things that we're going to find is happening, this is going to be Foucault's beginning, is um, that some of these old, bizarre forms of treatment that aren't based in science, this is sort of a vibratory way to handle headaches or delusions or something. We'll leave that aside. That may actually be, a, I'm not even sure where I got that. But, but instead, you're going to get these Quakerish and pietist moral reformers um, so this is his famous image. I think this is Pinnell uh, taking the chains off of the inmates, right? So removing the chains that were binding them and confining them and then seeking a kind of moral cure, right? So, so only the mad wind up in these institutions with other mad or mentally ill people. And then you develop pre treatment protocols by people who care, like Tuke and Pinnell at least a little bit, uh, to try to heal them. So that's the modern the modern world, the birth of the asylum. Okay, so it's Quaker and Pietists really that began to take care of their members of their society, the friendly society of friends. Anyone who lost reason, uh, you know, with humane and likely rather effective methods. So Tukin and Pinnell are the focus here, these two Frenchmen who uh, engage in these reform practices uh, to try to, um, you know, really use humanitarian treatment of others. Really Quaker values are at play here. So the values of brotherly love, the Society of Friends, brotherly love, that, um, that motivated their new treatment was negated and in inverted ultimately by the institutions that they built. So this is kind of a tragic story here. So all throughout Foucault's work, he keeps doing this. You know, people might have good intentions, but often the institutions that are built to implement good intentions undermine them. So these institutions had already existed. These reformers came in wanting to do good, um, but there were limits that were placed upon the capacity of their reform to actually affect cures by the logic of the confinement itself. And I think in the end, that's really Foucault's concern in this book. It's that, um, right, is that this double archeology span of madness and confinement and exclusion, that this is stigmatizing and that madness is stigmatizing largely because of the confinement and the exclusion that takes place. And that the treatment of madness, especially after psychoanalysis, right, where, and, and, and contemporary psychopharmaceuticals, 
the decarceration where we, we, we eliminated most of these big state hospitals and, and shifted to psychopharmaceuticals and, and outpatient treatment and outpatient therapy and psychoanalytic talk therapy and so on, that that, 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 that hadn't yet happened when Foucault uh, was there. So he was really questioning, I think, and kind of morally outraged um, at the need to keep people confined. Like, what is going on in these institutions? Why the need for confinement? And I think in the end, that's what he says. This is, this is a madness, right? So in writing the history of madness, the real madness that we have to understand is this compulsion to confine people who have mental illness as though they're contagious and as though they're lepers. And it turns out, right, that treating mentally ill people with a stigma as though they are lepers actually is historically accurate because the very locations and the very symbolic categories uh, by which the culture of the West copes with mental illness is leprosy. It's still there, right? So this long convoluted archaeology, what he finds at the end, when you really dig all the way down, you find that the mad are the people who are the recipients of moral panic and, uh, and uh, so that those who are outside can look at each other in the mirror of our exclusion. That the lepers began this and mentally ill people were in that position at that time. And then like in the history of sexuality, you know, gay people, um, you know, trans people, um, you know, um, and others are, are in that category, right? Um, in, in discipline and punish, people get caught up in, in the uh, criminal justice system as well. So these are the people that cause moral panic, that are, uh, again, symbolically coded as the sacred and pure. Back to this image again, right? The sacred and pure. And if you have a sacred and pure, you have to engage in, in negative rituals of purification and exclusion and even uh, piacular rites that expel and purify uh, by, uh, uh, by, and by, by, uh, you know, by, by expiating, by getting, uh, by cleansing uh, society of them, something like that. So, so, so this is that double archaeology. And when you follow, the, again, the convoluted path through the great confinement and the ship of fools and everything else, you find leprosy at the bottom. And so that symbolic coding of the leper within medieval society, right? Unclean, unclean, ritual exclusion, completely denied, um, you know, uh, Weber says that the table and, um, and the talk of, of, um, of being in communion and um, uh, with others. Uh, continues uh, for those who are so confined. Okay, so that's it. So, so these really well-meaning reformers are coming in, but they're walking into a world that's been symbolically constructed and even physically constructed uh, as though mental illness is leprosy. So they're working against a very strong, right? They're, they're rowing against a very strong current here. Okay. Um, all right, so the logic was consistent with the Lifeways of Quaker and Pietists. Um, uh, this is my own work, really, uh, and, and a little bit of David Hackett Fisher, a little bit of Weber, but a little bit of my own work. That the logic that's being implemented here is clearly Quaker pietist. He's, he says that out loud, Foucault does. There's innate reason or an inner light uh, that's been damaged or that's been overmastered or overwritten by negative social environment. And if you take people out of that negative environment, treat them well, reason will return to the throne. The inner light will again shine. If people are overburdened with worries and cares and anxieties and so on, you disencumber them. And then um, the inner light will, will reignite again and reason will return to its throne. Okay, so it's the logic of the time out or the logic of the time in solid, you know, in, in that sort of meditative cell of the old penitentiary, right? You take people out of a negative social environment and allow the inner light to shine, right? Reason will return. So page 243, the famous Toucan Pinnell unshackling, I already showed you that image. Um, yeah, the garden-like atmosphere, we've already talked about that. Self-restraint was viewed as a condition of the removal of those fetters and those restraints. So, um, uh, so there's an account of that. Calmness, kindness, responsibility, all of this helps. I really like some of these passages in here. We're almost out of time, so I'm not going to spend time reading them to you. But it, there, it's really... I mean, there's a massive difference here 
in the way that patients are treated or, or uh, uh, they, than we saw earlier. So what is the logic of sort of this Quakerish form of, of reform? Moral observation of others, taking people and putting them in a moral community where you're really feeling the pressure of social uh, regulation, right? That's on page 247. Uh, number two, work as a regulating um, um, a structure. So body and mind are, um, are kept um, occupied and are exercised and are kept ordered. Um, and so that this is called the work cure, right? The working cure. Now, during the Great Confinement, this was a very negative thing, right? I mean, you're just simply building a mindless industrial proletariat. But here, it's actually, it, 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 it really is more meditative, immersive, mindful immersion in work, that kind of thing is a working cure. Number three, positive esteem. People were treated with recognition, brought to table. There was no strong separation between the staff and the inmates. There was tea being shared, um, you know, uh, recreational activities, dances, uh, theatrical performances, and so on. So that the inmates were treated with the full round of humanity as much as possible, right? So instead of being chained up, you're performing in a play, right? Page 250, this was asymmetrical though. This is Foucault's point that all of the power in the end, in the end, was on the part of those who did the confining and managed the house of confinement, the keeper. And uh, they had all the innate power and that the powerless were the inmates and that you don't actually get a dialogue between the doctor and the patient until you get Freud in the talking cure. And that's gonna take place largely outside of these institutions. However, just like Freud, um, and you know, Freud really cashes in on this, says Foucault, um, and, and I don't mean cash in in money, I mean cash in for therapeutic effect. There was a, um, there's all, oh, sorry, let, let's do this real fast. There's surveillance and judgment that's underway at all times that the keeper of the asylum is in the moral position of the father and the inmate is in the moral position of the child. And Pinnell thought that religion, for example, was something that was a source often or a cause of mental illness. And he sought to remove that as much as possible. The Quakers weren't big on stimulation. They were quietus, actually, right? So uh, page 258, Quakerish conditions were established and benevolence, quietism, brotherly love um, that countered vices, right? There's a list of those on 258. So ascetic morality as a negation of vices. And so instead of tying up the unreasonable, it's treating the patient um, with brotherly love in a way that would now allow them to restrain themselves and to become, um, you know, contributing members of a moral community. Page 259, the classical period then, uh, ma in, in, so during the classical period up until now, madness and indigence and laziness and vice were all put together in that, um, in the, in the um, great confinement. The mat were caught in the great confinement of poverty and unemployment, that's 259, but in these new mental illness asylum, madness, is viewed as something that's caused by um, by the failures of society almost, right? A society of, of friends could cure those who had suffered moral failures of a society gone awry. So Pinnell's uh, Quaker Pietist system is described on 260. It, there's really four major elements of it. Silence and the silent treatment. There's great examples there. Recognition by mere um, there, there, there's here, there was an example, several of them in here, they're really good examples of, of someone who had the delusion that they were a king. And, uh, and basically, it wasn't until someone said, you know, that other person over there, they think they're king too, how can you both be king? And then they began to realize, well, maybe that's not it. But the silent treatment, not responding to people's delusions seemed to help dissolve it. And then mirroring and stuff, self-clarity, developing self-clarity. So a lot of this is contemporary therapeutics, it's just in a more refined way, right? So silence, uh, recognition by mirroring, perpetual judgment, right? Um, and then the apotheosis of the psychiatrist or the psychiatric professional, who then becomes an, uh, in a godlike way. Now, the downside of that is that the uh, psychiatrist or the doctor um, inherited the enormous power of the sadistic keepers of the Great Confinement era, right? 400 years of Great Confinement had given, with, with total sovereignty, had given uh, the inmates fear. So in the social imaginary, being in one of these spaces was not a picnic or a garden uh, or, or a tea party as it became under Pinnell. Instead, being in one of these institutions was a living hell. And um, so that power of the keeper was transferred onto the father figure, 
almost a godlike figure of the of, of the doctor and so they became a thaumaturge uh, a kind of magic power a person with magic powers and that much of the uh, of the clinical effectiveness of some of these techniques Foucault attributes simply to a kind of power imbalance between the inmate and the uh, innkeeper uh, the, 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 the manager of the of the asylum who had literally the power of life and death and so that 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 put the subordinate really almost powerless position of the inmate um, and then so they did seem like God and in many ways the the psychiatrist or the director really was a God did have magic powers they can make almost anything happen so Freud then would exploit page 2778 exploit this directly he would um, uh, rid curing people of all other elements except retaining that magic power of this godlike uh, psychiatrist, the subject who is supposed to know and who will, uh, who you just simply have to tell your fantasies and dreams to, and uh, a cure will result. So there we go. So, um, um, so the modern asylum that treats mentally ill people with modern psychiatry is rooted in a foundation of madness and moral panic about madness all the way down to um, to leprosy, the contagion of madness that reasserts itself. And then the confinement of the mentally ill has this long history going all the way back to the leper colonies again. So the symbolic order of leprosy, right? Leper, not leper, I know, I see leper, I see how badly lepers are treated, how bad their life is, that they're confined, and I know that I am one of the not lepers because I'm there, right? And there's a contagion here, and moral panic would ensue that led to the uh, creation of that category. So the real of leprosy disappeared, the symbolic category as well as the institutional and uh, imaginary structure remained, and then madness winds up taking over as a result. So it's this long sort of story, a double archaeology of, of, of the separation and segregation of madness in the medieval world into folly and foolishness and the, you know, the, the carnival of fools and so on, the ship of fools, the great confinement where the mad are caught up in this generalized uh, net you know, as Foucault says, uh, you know, where the poor are hunted like dogs by dog catchers, right? And people catchers, right? Marx calls them things like, you know, um, God, what does Marx use? You know, uh, child catchers or something like that. It's a strange name that's used for that. Child theft. Yeah, child thievers. And, and, and it's odd. Okay, and then once that's created, then you've got uh, the, the development of, of notions of mental illness from the insane to uh, passion, delirium, aspects of madness, doctors and patients, then the reemergence of that great stigma of out and fear, contagion and the great fear, this new division out, so that you wind up in the modern period with an asylum, a prison, um, a place of juvenile delinquency, a place for old people, uh, and maybe a place for the unemployed who are learning work skills or something, that, that are separated out and without the moral panic being as intense and that's where you wind up here all right so it's a good story so to me again the big thing that's worth teaching about this book is is um is that comprehension of the great confinement and the 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 incredible amount of symbolic weight that was attached to those who were who didn't fit into the emerging order of early capitalism to me all of the great weight of the book is here I think a lot of analysts get lost on the ship of fools and get lost on some of these category, you know, chapters dealing with, with madness and so on. But to me, this is it. The leper to this. The unemployed, the poor person, the beggar, uh, the person who refuses to work, right? And then these poor, you know, uh, literally these dispossessed people during the era of primitive accumulation forced, driven from their agrarian homestead, forced into cities, and then out of fear of being thrown into that pit 
of, of the Great Confinement except virtually any form of employment for self, for children, for family. Even if it leads to early death, it's going to lead to early death inside there too. And then out of that, you get the, the eventual distillation of, of the separated and segregated, classified houses of confinement for different groups. Okay? All right. Now, we know where this goes in other works. So, so um, uh, you know, in, in History of Sexuality and in um, um, Discipline and Punish. So with that, I hope you found this helpful.